Good afternoon, everybody. It's exactly 12, oh, excuse me, it's 12.01 here in Midtown Toronto. I'm Robert Austin from the Center for European, Russian, Eurasian Studies here at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Uh, joining us, I'll say a few words about them in a second for an, uh, what's part of a really ongoing and extremely important conversation about uh, war in Ukraine. Today's event brings together, for me, uh, three of the top specialists on Central Europe. Regrettably, and he's a mutual friend for all of us, Milan Nietzsche, who's a, a top expert on Slovakia, was not able to join us. But we have Jacek Kucharczyk from Poland, uh, Veronica. Uh, Veronica, you're, I don't want to mix up Veronica's. I've got Veronica Vikova, okay, uh, from Kremlin Watch in uh, Prague. And I've got Peter Greco from not just political capital, but he's also a professor. I can't imagine everybody a better group of people to provide some perspective on what's happening. One thing that's a priority for me in, in ensuring that we keep this focus on Ukraine, which I believe is, uh, is one of my most fundamental responsibilities here at the center, is to ensure that we get uh, voices from the region. And that's why we emphasize a lot talking to when we can uh, experts in Russia, and we try to connect where possible, as much as possible, with our colleagues that find themselves still in Ukraine, but also who have found themselves in exile. So I'm not gonna do big introductions. We have uh, approximately 55 minutes together and uh, I'm anticipating a, a, an extremely important conversation. And I see we have a very large audience. You know that if you want to ask questions, uh, you use the, the, the Q and A function. I'll try to get to them, but what, in, a, my moder in my role as a moderator, everybody, I'm gonna be asking uh, my friends in Central Europe some questions. And we're gonna go in an order that will become quite random, but let's see how it goes because each person has different expertise. But I wanna start by saying something that's really topical, which is uh, we saw this visit take place of three you know, Central European leaders to Kyiv on a, on a train. And by the way, you know, I hope people in North America get that. That was a potentially very dangerous journey, okay? Uh, it, was taken on, it was taken under a, a huge amount of secrecy and it, it had enormous symbolic importance. Starting with you, uh, Veronica, and then I'll go to Jacek and then Peter. Tell me a bit more about what what the meaning of this and what we what we should take away from this this initiative. Hi, um, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, yeah, I think that um, uh, it it is a really very strong gesture uh, by uh, which our states uh, are trying to make it really clear that the Ukraine is not alone in that fight um, that is being shown by the Ukrainian people is, um, is absolutely amazing and it really deserves our admiration and um, our greatest possible support. So because the Ukraine, um, the war in Ukraine also affects our states and it's essential that the Ukrainian officials and the citizens know um, that we are ready to help them um, as best we can. So. I think it's a really, really strong gesture, and it's not only towards um, uh, the Ukrainian officials and Ukrainian citizens, but I think it um, it's a very strong gesture also towards other uh, European countries, especially the European Union leaders um, in the West, um, in the West like France and Germany, that um, is saying that here we are um, and uh, we are doing, uh, we are like really hugely supporting Ukraine, and you're not really doing as much as you could be doing. Thanks, Veronica. And just a quick clarification, because I want to stress that that's Veronica Spalkova from, uh, from right. Kremlin. She's replacing Veronica Vikova, so that's it. And we didn't update the website, but I'll try to get, thank you very much, Veronica. Jacek, perspective from Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, from Poland, as always, there is a very mixed reception. I mean, uh, most uh, people across the political spectrum appreciate the symbolic importance of this gesture. The fact that they went there uh, when no West European leader uh, was uh, uh, brave enough to, to, to go to Kiev. Uh, in fact, I, I, I witnessed uh, about 10 days ago a speech, the speech by Boris Johnson in Warsaw, and there was a Ukrainian journalist who stood up and said, Mr. Johnson, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, why are you in Warsaw and not in Kiev? And uh, so, so from that point of view, I, I think there is a uh, consensus here that that, uh, that that this was an important visit and uh, we we have a feeling that also this was appreciated by by our Ukrainian friends. 
uh, whereas the, the content of the visit is, is a bit controversial, especially because uh, I think it would have been much better if only Mr. Morawiecki was there. Uh, Kaczynski's word about NATO peacekeeping force uh, basically divided the, the expert, the public opinion, because some few people think that this is an example of uh, lack of preparation, you know, that, that, that this, 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 this isn't it. like he threw in an idea which uh, is very difficult how to make sense of it, uh, will be badly uh, received in, the, in other European capitals. So, so uh, Kaczynski already has, has always managed to divide the Polish public opinion as he always, uh, always does. Uh, uh, and, and there is a lot of cynicism about assessing his own motives to, to be there because he wanted to basically play the role of his, his older brother Lech Kaczynski who uh, went to... Uh, Beliefs. Uh, most people, even, even critics of Kaczynski, appreciate the gesture. I think it was important and uh, an important signal towards uh, uh, Western European leaders that they should maybe get up more courage in supporting Ukrainian resistance to Russia. Yeah, it was a very important point. And I like knowing that the Ukrainian journalist asked the British Prime Minister why he was giving a speech. And that's a good question. I'm wondering, what was his, did he have a, an acceptable answer to that question? No, no, as, as always, as Boris Johnson is, you know, he, he, he gave a very general assurance how much he supports Ukrainian struggle and mentioned the uh, uh, arms supply, which are important as yes. Britain played play the role. Uh, he, he, you know, Boris Johnson can be very passionate or appear very passionate. So, uh, but that was, that was a very, very difficult moment. You could see watching him during this, uh, when the question was asked. And actually the video went viral. You, you can find it on the internet when she's asking the question and watching his face. He didn't have a good answer why he, he didn't go to Kiev. Okay. And Veronica, I'll probably come back to you. I'm interested if the, if you're president, uh, how things have changed for him regarding, but I'll leave that out there for a second. I'll turn to my old friend, Peter Greco, again in Budapest. Peter, absent was, uh, there are three leaders. So we have Polish leader, we have Czech leader, and we have a Slovene leader. That's not all of Central Europe, of course, but absent is, of course, the Prime Minister of Hungary. So, but how does this play out? How does this visit play out in Hungary? Yeah, so first of all, thanks a lot, Robert, for, for having us for this, this uh, discussion. Yeah, I think the timing is simply perfect. I would say that Bishbi had the same problem uh, that Jacek was just talk, talked about, that it, it was two leaders who, who turned up uh, in, in Kiev and, and that was not well coordinated. Because when the Hungarian prime minister was asked, uh, if, if uh, he knows about the visit, if he was invited and he, if he's planning to go. And of course, we have to add that yesterday it was the celebration of, the, of March 15, the, the, one of the most important uh, national celebrations in Hungary, where uh, Hungary is celebrating the freedom fight, the freedom fight uh, from the Habsburg Empire that was broke down, by the way, by the Habsburg and the Russian empires. But so Orban had to stay at home because it's just two weeks uh, until the election. But the big problem is that he did not send even one message of sympathy. He did not say that I cannot be there, but I'm wholeheartedly with my Central Eastern U European friends. And don't forget that two of them uh, are his illiberal allies, Jansha and Morawiecki, are yeah. all, uh, uh, how to say, uh, part of the same camp uh, within Central Eastern Europe that is rather uh, forming a, an anti-block against Brussels in many sense. Yeah. But, but the response from the Hungarian government was that Prime Minister is aware of this visit, but he is not going to Kiev now. And that was all. And at the same day, he delivered a speech on the 15th of March when he practically, as an EU and NATO member state, uh, said that Hungary has to keep an equal distance from Ukraine and Russia, when he also said that Brussels and the United States are, uh, their interests are different from Hungary. 
So it was a speech of almost neutrality, which is strange from the prime minister of uh, a new NATO uh, member state. And um, after one, two weeks of hesitation that how to handle this whole situation uh, before the campaign uh, about the war, finally the message is that Hungary just have to stay out of the war. So back to your question, the reception was very divided. We are in the middle of the campaign. Uh, Donald Tusk was in, in Hungary delivering a speech uh, on the side of the opposition candidate. Um, and Donald Tusk is the leader of the European People's Party that just expelled Orban a year ago. And the message there was that it's a shame that Orban is not there. And it's a shame that Orban is, is covered, not to call Putin by name and not to support Ukraine. And the narrative on the governmental side was just, this is a gesture that's just um, pours fuel on the fire and, and can just escalate the situation further. Uh, so there is no one general narrative. I have to tell everything is divided uh, among party lines. You know, Peter, we're, Peter, we're going to come back to that, uh, especially in how this shapes. And I want to have some domestic inputs on how this shapes the, the upcoming Hungarian election. And I want to thank you for mentioning yesterday was, of course, March 15th, which uh, I teach Hungarian history, as you know. So we were just talking about that. And also to remind that the Hungarian Revolution of 1848, which started mid-March 1848, with Petrovi Sándor, uh, Hungary's national poet, and then subsequently being crushed by Austrian forces, Croatian forces, of course, but decisively was the intervention of Russia in the east of Hungary in 18, in 18, actually the summer of 1849. That's the historian in me talking right now, and I apologize. Veronica, I want to come back to you in Prague right now. You know, I, I, I get most of my information when I, when I analyze what's happening, and I, I, I have to be frank with all of you. What's happening is a source of enormous stress. And I say that as someone who's in living in a country that's to a degree removed, but I work, I work with Ukrainians. My students are Ukrainians. My students are also Russians too. I have, you know, Canada, is, the, the beauty of Canada is it has this incredibly diverse environment, but I find what's happening, especially as a historian, you know, who studied 20th century Europe, the number of parallels that I can find just staying up at night causes me enormous uh, amount of fear. So Veronica, when I read, I, I, I still can't get it sometimes. As a specialist, you know, you've done a lot of work on, on understanding Russia and understanding Russian misinformation. And this is for all of you, but I'll start with you. What's the end game here? Because I don't get it. I don't know. I, again, for me, I only see bad options and extremely bad options. So what, what's your take on what uh, Russia can live with in this, this catastrophe that they have unleashed here? Well, this is a very good question, very complex one, um, and I wish I'd have a one straight answer to that, but um, there's a lot of different scenarios, positive ones, negative ones, of how <clears throat> this all could, uh, could end. Um, I, I really, really want to be um, an optimist, and I re really want to think that it's going to have some sort of a more optimistic end. And um, like, uh, I think that the most optimistic version that is just circulating uh, um, in, in the security community is that uh, just the oligarchs or Russian people are gonna get rid of Putin and Russia uh, will remain um, <clears throat> as um, a somehow confident country, but, um, you know, uh, into to some extent, Stand, but um, I think that uh, right now it looks like um, there is uh, no one or nothing that can broke it off uh, easily. Uh, Ukrainian people and army they're very resistant, and uh, I don't think that they're going to like give up. Um, I'm convinced that even if at the end of the day the government uh, themselves would make the, the the decision to actually surrender. I don't think that's going to happen. But if if it would happen, I don't think that the army and the people would actually give up. I think that they would continue the fighting. Um, but on the other hand, we see some indications uh, from the Russian side that they are not going to uh, give up so easily. Uh, you know, they have troubles. They it it just it um, it's um, 
uh, it's not going as um, as they expected. But um, uh, these indications that they are going to fight uh, more, like that they are asking China for some support or uh, or so uh, soldiers from Syria, it suggests that. Uh, it's going to continue. So I don't think that's going to uh, um, end very soon. And um, there is always uh, this um, nuclear weapons card that Putin is um, still uh, willing to play. And I think that uh, the more he's going to put pressure on using the, the nuclear weapons, the more uh, NATO countries are uh, or the less NATO countries will be willing to do anything about it. I think that um, because I hear some opinions, especially around my friends, that they think that if Putin would actually really like use some technical um, nuclear weapons like somewhere just to protect, uh, uh, per, uh, just to proceed the power and and um, and show that he actually is willing to use them, they feel like NATO is going to respond very quickly and. I don't think that's true. <laughs> so yeah, right now I think that um, the end is not uh, very, is, is not going to happen soon. Thanks, Veronica. Jacek, the view from Warsaw. Mm -hmm. I think the view from Warsaw is that uh, what's at stake here uh, is the survival of Ukraine as an independent country. Sorry if it sounds obvious, but uh, I think the feeling is that it's it's not enough to sanction Russia and wait until you know its economy collapses. Uh, the 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 priority is uh, giving Ukrainians all all possible support to to resist Russia until the, 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 the invasion is, is, is uh, in fact stopped and the, the, there is some kind of uh, uh, ceasefire that will, that will preserve the, the control of Ukrainian government over most of, of the country's territory. So uh, I, I, I mean, uh, this is probably not a, an easy uh, end game, but this is what, what uh, I think is the immediate, immediate concern. So, uh, the worst case scenario would be uh, a collapse of the government in Kiev and uh, the kind of, you know, uh, making Ukraine a, a, a kind of twin of Belarus that is de facto, uh, 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 you know, the, the, that country that, that will only on paper be independent but will host Russian army just across Polish border and, and so on and so forth. So. I think this is this is uh, this is the the priority here is to let Ukrainians resist and uh, give them whatever uh, whatever whatever support we can. Uh, there is a certain fatigue uh, with the statements from Western capitals about you know we have to do everything not to escalate, not to escalate. Uh, I mean, many people here think that basically it's it's a misconception because. Uh, Putin, uh, the way to stop Putin is actually to show, show resolve uh, rather than show a, a willingness to compromise. So uh, I understand that many of my Ukrainian colleagues are very annoyed hearing the calls from Western experts that they should consider a compromise with Russia because, uh, because basically Putin is a bully who only responds to force and that we, we need to make sure that uh, that that he feels this this force. So that's that's you know that I, I I mean it's not a plan, and I I don't consider myself to be a military expert to 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 see how it can play out. But I can tell you what what the feeling is here, and, uh, and that there was there, there was a lot of uh, disappointment that that this uh, uh, idea to give Ukrainians me Polish mix didn't fly. Uh, the, 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 there are um, confused opinions about whose fault it is that this, this idea didn't come through. Uh, but but generally, uh, generally people think that, that uh, the risk that, that it would involve was, was worth taking. That was, that was the, the sort of, let's say, prevailing opinion. 
uh, here and that that we need something more uh, than uh, than Ukrainians uh, to send to send more uh, 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 weaponry and support military support than they are currently receiving so because because that's that's just stepping up sanctions which is important is it's not enough thank you i'm going to come back for all three of you uh, regarding nato and different perceptions of nato within central europe so I'm going to come back to that. And also, I'd like to bring in the issue of trust in NATO. That's another thing I'd like to talk about. And I know, Jacek, you have some uh, recent new polls. But Peter, again, let's come back to uh, to Budapest and look at it from... And we talked a bit about this last week uh, regarding what your perception of what the endgame was. Uh, let's hear it from you. Yes, I, I think that Putin and, and the Russians show zero... Uh, zero willingness to compromise. And uh, when the Ukrainian side even um, raised the opportunity, Zelensky himself, that let's drop the NATO issue of NATO accession, which would be something crucial as it is in the constitution of, of Ukraine, then the response one was the, from the Russian side. And it was the one demand of Russia, by the way, was that, Ukraine does not seem to seriously want to go into a compromise. And let's imagine if it's really credible that a, a country that is being massacred at the moment by the Russians really do not want to get into a compromise. So I think that, that I, I have zero expectation towards the negotiations and not because of the Ukrainians, but because of the Russians and how trustworthy the Russians are. I think the whole world could uh, get an impression uh, after several months of denying the willingness to to um, run over Ukraine, and finally it happened. So I I have bad uh, expectations in the sense that um, I don't think Putin will stop until there is a Russian flag at the Maidan, and I don't think Putin will stop until he can chase away or kill the current uh, government in Ukraine, and he just told it in the camera that he wants to, in, the, in his long speech, history speech. Uh, so if, if your students want to uh, learn really good history, then this is the, the speech to, to look at. So the one hour long speech in which uh, Putin announced his willingness to, to uh, go into Ukraine and, and or the whole justification, which, which was false in, in so many sense that you just can't count, but, but one element was that uh, let's denazify Ukraine. And he referred to the Ukrainian uh, government as a, as a Nazi junta, which is interesting in the sense that beforehand, Russia also acknowledged uh, this Ukrainian government. But I don't think he can stop uh, before he wins this war. And of course, uh, I, I, I really admire the heroism of, of Ukraine. And I think Ukraine teaches bravery and heroism for the whole world and this 19th century idea of patriotism dying for your own nation i think it's just getting resurrected uh, before our eyes but i mean the asymmetry is still huge and i think putin wants to win the war i think it can be a very long war and what i'm afraid of is that right now all the eyes on ukraine and russia but there can be such a thing as a war fatigue that we can observe in many, many cases when there are conflicts around the world. So right now we are looking at the humanitarian crisis. We are looking at the casualties on the Ukrainian side, but hopefully this attention will prevail. And I think we have to all do about that this attention prevails and this, uh, this totally amoral and, and abnormal situation does not uh, does not become the new normal thanks very much peter and again to your points and i'm going to come back to this i'd like to in this conversation ensure that uh, you mentioned ukrainian heroism which is really well documented in, in the in the western media but i want to also particularly the role of poland here but also hungary for sure we have to talk about the response in central europe to the humanitarian crisis and i might leave that to the end but you know, particularly Poland has played an, an, an enormously important role in, in dealing with this, with the crisis of people fleeing, 
fleeing the conflict. But that I'm going to talk about later. I want to come back to something that the three of you talked about, which is NATO. And I'm trying to integrate some of the questions that appear in the in the chat. And Leon Kozals, who's a colleague here, um, teaching, he's asking about the and so two questions: Do Central Europeans trust NATO? Let's you know. I know it's a big question, but you know, NATO's experience is kind of limited in the sense that they're, you know, they're in theory, you know, Kosovo is not Ukraine, you know, and I was, I was in Albania during the Kosovo war. So is there, what's the trust factors, you know, do Central Europeans believe that NATO is, is technically there for them? And the other thing is, what are the Central Europe, and this is from Leon more than me, what is the perspective among Central Europeans on the issue of the no-fly zone? So, I'm going to stick to the same order. It seems to be working for me, and I hope it's working for the audience. So I start with Veronica. Veronica, over to you. Yeah. Uh, well, in the Czech Republic, the, um, the trust um, towards NATO is actually a really big question. Uh, it's um, it's similar with the European Union as an institution. Uh, this these two institutions have been picked up by. Um, extreme uh, right and left political parties as one of the pinpoint topics for their political campaigns. Um, they're very anti-NATO and anti-European Union. Um, so uh, we do have a certain amount of citizens. Right now, I think it's about 20% uh, who give their votes to these political parties that are against European Union and against NATO. And um, these political parties and their politicians are demanding the withdrawal from both of these institutions um, in some um, really, um, I, I'd say um, they have a very naive uh, image of Czech Republic being a neutral state which is insane um, in our geographical area. Um, right now, uh, when uh, the, the war in Ukraine uh, broke out, uh, most of these voices are now silent when it comes to the NATO topic. They're not really uh, being very vocal about their anti-European attitude, uh, anti-NATO attitudes. Uh, and like the, the, general, uh, the general support of NATO um, has risen among the Czech citizens. They are now like really happy that we are a part of this um, this institution. But I think it's about the momentum. A lot of the citizens are just like in shock of what happened uh, and what is still happening. And um, I think that if we we won't be able to um, maintain this momentum of the support. Uh, and we will let the Russian propaganda to, to um, sort of undermine uh, these processes, uh, it's going to change again. It's going to just like really change again. But um, in general, more than half of the Czech citizens are supporting NATO. You're muted, Robert. Yeah, no, I just, I, can't, I don't know why. I apologize. It shouldn't happen. <laughs> it's <for> okay. <laughs> But Veronica, but is there support? Is there support? For no fly zone? Is that the same kind of statistic? You know, 50% yes, or not really discussed? I think that most um, most of the people don't really understand what are the consequences of that. Uh, it um, sounds like they are supporting it because um, they are not really understanding what technically uh, it means and what are the, 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 the consequences of that. So uh, they feel like this is uh, somehow somewhat an easy solution to this whole conflict that if uh, the no-fly zone is going to happen, it's just going to solve everything and uh, we won't be bothering with that conflict anymore. Uh, so I think that these people, like half of the citizens maybe they do support it, but if they would be if they would really understand what it's what is it about and uh, what are the possible consequences, uh, they might uh, change their mind. Got it. Thanks very much, Jacek. And again, you have some polls that you mentioned. We'll maybe come to some of them now. And of course, when we think about Central European perspective, we'll come back to that. So, Poland, NATO, trust. 
No flies. Uh, the, there is uh, unfortunately this the, the polling I mentioned uh, does not include question about NATO, but the trust in NATO or support for NATO membership has been consistently very, very high. I mean, in the area of 80 percent throughout this last decade, at least since the, uh, you know, the, the, the annexation of Crimea. So uh, you, you can fairly assume that, that the trust is, is uh, at least as high as it was or, or possibly even higher. Uh, but there is also a, a second sort of layer to this, this issue of trust in NATO. And this is more about the sort of elite and experts discussion uh, because uh, uh, that, and on this level, people, uh, experts think that sort of additional assurance to uh, membership is the presence of American troops and other NATO countries troops in Poland. And that, that has been a crucial discussion in Poland. And uh, despite the change of government, basically the, the uh, rhetoric, the narrative from Warsaw was always, we need more American troops. And this is happening now. Uh, I, I think now there are about 10,000 troops in Eastern Poland already. And this is something that, that is a sort of, you know, an, an additional, uh, uh, additional security guarantee. So it's not just that we are members of NATO and there is Article 5, but we have Americans troop, American troops there uh, and we can have more because there is infrastructure. So this is, this is where the focus of, of attention is these days. Uh, uh, and uh, one, one of the striking results of this opinion polling that I mentioned that we did and published today is also we asked about uh, how people feel uh, uh, about the announcement of uh, uh, Chancellor Scholz about uh, rearming uh, Germany. And it turns out that there is record high support in Poland for uh, German rearmament. That is, uh, there is a, a clear majority of people who think that, that this will make Poland more secure. So, so it's not only about NATO and Americans, but also uh, uh, stronger Germany is perceived here as, as something that is an additional, uh, uh, improves our security vis-a-vis -vis Russia, which is seen as the main, main threat by almost everybody. Thanks, Jacek. And again, one of my colleagues just pointed out, maybe Peter, you can add this to the answer about, when I say no-fly zone, maybe I'm being too limited because there also is the issue of providing Ukrainian with more support so that they can shoot down aircraft, which means uh, anti-aircraft weapons, because the no-fly zone is one thing, but arming the Ukrainians so they can better deal with it. So Peter, if you don't mind putting that into the conversation a bit when we're thinking about uh, NATO, no-fly zone, and, and better arming Ukraine and how that shapes up uh, the discussion in Hungary. Yeah, crucially important questions. And, and I would start with the good news. The good news is Despite the quite strong anti-Western, anti-American rhetoric that we could hear from the governmental side in the last years, NATO enjoys unquestionable support in the population. When, when Hungary joined, uh, voted on the accession uh, to NATO in, uh, in 1997, 85% uh, of the Hungarians supported NATO, and we have about the same percentage now. According to a Globsec poll that Hungary was, that political capital was also participating, 80% uh, of Hungarians would vote for staying in the NATO and only 10% of them would uh, vote against NATO. 10% is undecided. And this high support for NATO is the third highest after Poland, obviously, where it's 90%. Uh, and after Lithuania, uh, this is the third highest in Central Eastern Europe, which is a remarkable figure. So the pro-Western attitudes in Hungary, I, I would say the shelter for pro-Western attitudes is, is the attitude towards uh, NATO. And despite the fact that, that there has been some, uh, of course, wave of, of uh, skepticism about how much NATO would defend Central Eastern European countries if there would be a 
an attack and and you ha hear these skeptic voices even in the mainstream this support of nato remain uh, remained unquestionable when it comes to no fly zones it's an absolute no in hungary and don't forget that none of the nato countries practically at the moment wants to risk supporting a no fly zone no leader really dares to say that okay we are open to go into a full scale war with uh, with russia because this is what would mean and to be frank i'm not entirely sure it's it it is evitable it's we can avoid that and and i think poland is especially in the front line of all the threats with recently a rocket uh, quite close to the polish border uh, was was uh, targeting an um, a military base so i i think that that uh, i'm not sure that that this kind of let's stay out of the conflict from nato will be a, a position that they will keep uh, yesterday i had the chance to have uh, have a few words with with uh, donald tusk and 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 he told and i think in in poland you hear these voices that if all the nato members would be in favor of how to say supporting ukraine then then the nato should go but i think this is at the moment is is a is a is a scenario that we absolutely cannot forget and i can just repeat myself that that the hungarian position or i would say the position of the hungarian prime minister and fidesz is that we have to stay out of this conflict and the only thing that we want is peace but of course it's a hypocritical rhetoric and i'm happy that that this rhetoric is not the same as the actions of the Hungarian government because the Hungarian government, uh, and it's it's a response to your second question, Robert. The Hungarian government also supported the EU transfer of lethal weapons to Ukraine. And okay, the Hungarian government says that there that and there is a decree that they cannot be transferred through uh, the territory of Hungary directly to Ukraine, not to make Hungary uh, a target. For, for Russian bombs, but indirectly it can. And I, Hungary does not transfer any weapons on a bilateral manner uh, to, uh, to, to, to Ukraine, unlike Poland, unlike Czech Republic, unlike Slovakia as well, so unlike Romania. And I, I'm sad that it does not happen. On the other hand, uh, Orban brings the minimum. And let me just respond a question to of of Ennis uh, who who raised this question Orban so far have supported all the EU sanctions even reluctantly and talking about them but I think action is more important right now than rhetoric and at least in action Orban gave up his anti-sanctions policies that he was talking about next to Putin and also Orban uh, elevated the blockade of the EU and NATO accession that Hungary, the, as the only NATO country, had before. So I think it's already a remarkable development, even if the rhetoric that sometimes comes out of Budapest is quite horrifying in the sense that 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 it's it's about this neutral position. The the decisions of the government is more pro EU, pro NATO than the rhetoric. Peter, thank you for in injecting that nuance into that. That's not something that comes clear, at least in the way we cover the war here in Canada. Yeah, Jacek, I see your hand up. It's funny the way the hand is located it, uh -huh. in the middle of the frame. So I thought it was a painting. It's not <laughs> okay. a great no, one. Not either. a painting, but a hand. It's, yeah, yes, Jacek, yes, I, I forgot to, to, to mention about no fly zone, uh, the, the discussion in Poland. Uh, there was uh, no important statement in support of sort of, you know, the no flight zone over all over Ukraine, even though I think there is an understanding that when Ukrainians uh, ask for this, they, they basically raising the stakes. Uh, so, so people here also don't criticize Ukrainians for asking this, but there are other options that are being under discussion and obviously the first thing that, that happened was this attempt to, to, to hand over Polish MiGs. Uh, but uh, as, as Peter said uh, about what Tusk says, it's that we, we wanted to, uh, this to be a decision from NATO and, and not just unilateral gift from Poland. So, and, and then uh, my feeling is that it was killed off by, by US administration that through 
press leaks, but uh, there is a discussion here why why it didn't uh, why the mix didn't fly, uh, let's say. But uh, I, I think that what Zelensky today said in in the Congress uh, that uh, we ask for no flight zone, but if this is impossible, uh, if this is impossible, let's have uh, let's have uh, let's uh, give us air aircraft and. Uh, anti-air uh, defense system. So, uh, I, and this is this was the interpretation that mm -hmm. maybe you shouldn't treat it literally. And there is also some discussion about limited no-flight zone over Western Ukraine. Uh, that that's uh, that's another topic. So it's it's complicated. And again, there is no not a single narrative about it. Thank you, Jacek. Veronica. That is not a painting. That is a hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to add, uh, if, if we broaden this, uh, this question about no-fly zone to the military support that like we are sending weapons to Ukrainians, I wanted to say that uh, there is a really high support uh, among the, the Czech society for doing this. Uh, Czech citizens are very much supportive of, uh, of this kind of military assistance um, to, to Ukraine from our side. And uh, we even initiated um, a bank account that uh, belongs to the Ukrainian embassy uh, in Prague. And this bank account uh, is um, specifically for the purpose of buying weapons so that people can send money to this, uh, to this public bank account. And this money is used only for buying more weapons uh, for, for the Ukrainian uh, people and army. Uh, so I just wanted to add that. Thanks, Veronica. Sorry, that's my, I apologize. I forgot my, my traditional telephone is ringing, but I'm not going to answer it. I want to come back to something. And again, I'm going to be a historian here. And all of you have touched upon this. And again, the, the focus is Ukraine, but you know, we're having this Central European perspective. And I do believe, Jacek, this is where some of this polling uh, and the perspective of Central Europeans on what this means will become important. The history of Central Europe is one of vulnerability. And Veronica, you mentioned that when someone says, you know, the Czech Republic should be neutral. This is an absurdity. You know, if you know even a shred of Czech history, you're going to know that that was kind of tried between, 40, you know, 45 to 48. The Czechoslovakia thought that something different could happen than did, all right? But vulnerability is, is embedded in, in, in Central Europe. If you look at the events as they transpired in the 1930s, you know, I teach Central European history and I'm telling students that the world is shaped in the 20th century by events in Central Europe. And I include Ukraine there, by the way. So, and one of the questions we're seeing is, what's the sense of vulnerability in Central Europe to this conflict? And because I feel the threat is, is, is extremely real. And I'm wondering how, how that shapes out the perceptions of the conflict, et cetera. Because, you know, you, you know okay, not Czech Republic, but you're sharing borders. Uh, and th this has to be, you know, front and center. Not that everyone's great on geography, but I, I at least know where, where the borders are. So what's the sense of vulnerability of Central Europe? Be mindful of Central Europe's past, which is made better by alliances, right? You know, NATO and EU, this is like, Without that, you know, God knows what would have happened. That's why I can't stand that conversation about NATO enlargement ruined everything. This is, <laughs> it's so boring for me. I can't even believe it because it's also counterfactual, right? And I'm a historian. We don't do counterfactuals, right? We do deal with the facts. And Peter, you've already mentioned, like, you know, don't forget these alliance, memberships in these alliances were voted, for, voted upon and largely supported by overwhelming majorities of people because of the legacy of vulnerability. Sorry, that was a really long, almost rant from me, but I'm throwing it out there. Veronica, like always, you're first. Yeah, um, I think it's different for the Czech Republic than for Poland or Slovakia, uh, because they are so much closer geographically to Russia. And given the historical circumstances, uh, I completely understand um, the, the sense of vulnerability from the Polish side. Um, in Czech Republic, we can, um, I think that people feel uh, more threatened by Russia, uh, like in this, in this really physical kind of way. Uh, we've been trying for years to um, put some attention to other 
more hybrid threats that Russia poses uh, to the Czech citizens and Czech Republic, you know, economic influence, um, information influence, etc. But um, this uh, is, I think, too abstract for uh, for regular people. And right now, they uh, really feel like they can be physically harmed, uh, and that's really, really strong because um, they're feeling um, scared and angry, and these are amongst the most uh, powerful uh, emotions that a person can feel. Uh, so, yeah, uh, for example, that uh, we uh, can see that uh, there is a so much bigger interest in um, active army reserves, that people are really applying to be a part of, um, part of active army reserves here in the Czech Republic. It's not mandatory, but um, there are even um, they're trying to open a discussion. Some politicians are trying to open a discussion that it can be uh, uh, mandatory for us to actually take part. Uh, this is something that hasn't been discussed um, for years as, um, as a part of the political debate or public debate here. So it, it's really like I feel how people suddenly realize that Russia really isn't that far away and uh, they are being afraid for their 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 like physical well being. Uh, thank you, thank you, Veronica Jacek. Yeah, yes, we we we've been polling this issue for quite a few years, and we've seen the growing sense that Russia is a military threat to Poland. Uh, this recent poll after the invasion shows uh, uh, around eighty percent uh, who said that Russia is a military threat. But the, the change from before the invasion is, is 10 percentage points. So it means that even before Russians attacked, the 70% of Poles felt that Russia is a, is a military threat. So the, 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 this is not such a big change in the sense of, of, of I mean, the, the sense of vulnerability was there for a long time. Now there is a sense of vindication because when we looked at what the, the discussion in Germany, uh, we say, we told you so, yes, that Germans now discover what we knew uh, for a long time. And, and interestingly enough, if you want to take a look at this report, this is a study in Poland and Germany. For the first time ever, the sense of threat from Russia and Germany is comparable to the sense of threat in Poland. We, we were quite amazed to see, but this is also nearly... 80% of the Germans in this opinion poll said that Russia may pose military threat to Germany. So this is, uh, this is much bigger change than, than, than in Poland. Uh, and the reactions are, are very, very diverse, let me say. So on one hand, as Veronica said, there are more people volunteering to serve in these territorial defense units. But at the same time, many people realize that, for example, their children don't have passports. And we see long queues in front of passport offices, you know, for people mainly wanting to renew their passports because there is a sense of threat. So that there are very different, uh, different reactions. But also one of the biggest changes uh, since this a period before the invasion is also the willingness to send weapons in, in Ukraine. Now it's, it's again a, around 80% of people in Poland support arming Ukrainians to be able to defend themselves. So, so this, is, this is the reaction. But also there is a sense that, that uh, we were warning about Russia, we were right and uh, the West wouldn't hear. So it's uh, again sort of traditional Polish narrative, if you may, but there is a sense of, of the, that, that we were proven right uh, in, this, in, this, in this debate about you know, Putin and Russia and, and the developments in the East. Thanks. Um, I'm going to go to Peter now, and then Peter, don't forget, remind me, we all want to know what you think this means for the elections in April, because up until now, the Hungarian prime minister was unfairly, actually, that's an understatement, on very good terms with the Russian president, as I do recall, visited him more than, or met him more than any person other than the former chancellor of Germany, uh, Chancellor Merkel, but Peter, on vulnerability and some of the themes that Veronica and Jacek just talked about. Yeah, so... I think the current 
uh, crisis reveals that how different the reactions of Central Eastern European countries can be, at least rhetorically. And I, I think the reaction of the public opinion in a crisis situation like that is pretty much dependent on the reaction of the political elites. So I think in this situation, the government has a big power on shaping public opinion. And, and it's very interesting that, that Poland, um, of course, Poland has an even more tragic history with Russia, but Hungary has a quite tragic one as well. Russia broke down two of the uh, freedom fights of Hungarians, and there was the 40 years of, of, uh, of, of Russian occupation. And okay, Hungary was the happiest Barak, but it was still not that happy, I have to tell. And, uh, and, and, and still, the reaction is totally different. The, I would say that in, in the political psychology, there is this, uh, there is an, uh, uh, there is a theory that that when a terror attack hits a country, the reaction is not fight or flight, but fight and flight. And I think this is what we can more or less observe in Poland, where on the other, on the one hand, you have a very high threat perception and fear over the war. On the other hand, the reaction is that we have to defend ourselves and we have to be strong in the alliance and we have to support our friends who are fighting against the enemy. What is the reaction in Budapest? We have to stay out of the conflict. We don't have to send there neither troops nor weapons. We have to, uh, we have to stay silent until the big guys just uh, fighting their war. And the big, what they mean the big guys, of course, it's not Ukraine and Russia, but it's the United States and Russia, bringing in the narrative that you have just uh, mentioned, Robert, that it was finally the West or the NATO that provoked the war which I think is, is a horrible narrative because if, if uh, Russia would use the same narrative for Hungary, for example, or any of the Central Eastern European countries, then at the moment when they decided that they want to join the UN NATO, they, he, they could have just overrun the country. So it's like, it's, it's, it's a total moral double standard, which is, I think, in Central Eastern Europe, totally unacceptable. So the government right now, uh, just all emphasizes that that they want to keep uh, the peace and with an increasingly high pensioner rate in Bodes Fidesz's water camp, the two messages that let's keep the peace, why the opposition is a warmonger, they say, which is not true, but but it fits into this dichotomous logic of, of populism. Second, that we ha still have to keep good ties with Russia. Uh, or not to be the warmongers because we need cheap energy and and our friendship with Russia or let's say the no pragmatic relationship with Russia is is a guarantee for that. These are quite popular narratives in the Hungarian public opinion, and for that reason, even if Hungary, tot if even if Orbán totally loses his image as a freedom fighter, because from a big fighter he right now became practically the this this dove of peace that just uh, that just uh, says that we have to stay silent and have to stay out of the conflict and we do not want war uh, and so on and so on. So it's a loss for his image, but on the short run it can help him in a bizarre way. I think to win election and also if you take into consideration that there is a rally, rally around the flag effect. I think in most of the Central Eastern European countries, in Poland, the government's popularity went up with 10%, of course, with a very different uh, uh, politics than in Hungary, but, but all the eyes are on the government at the moment and the government can capitalize on that. Uh, so I think I would say that on the long run, it can even turn in favor of Orban in a very bizarre manner, because as you said, uh, Orban is the most pro-Russian prime minister in, in the whole uh, European Union. But on the longer run, I think his foreign policy have utterly failed. And if he will have to run one more government, he and either have to go Canossa and go to Berlin, go to all the Western capitals and rebuild the broken relationships, or... He, he can just think that, that China is the new Eastern uh, brother who he has to gravitate to. And, and Orban open, already opened this up when in an interview telling that the new world order will be dominated by China. So unfortunately, I don't think that this historic moment will correct 
the pro-Eastern uh, diversion of Hungarian foreign policy. Thanks, thanks, Peter. We've got a few minutes. We could go, if you're okay, we could go a couple of minutes over, but because is, is that all right if we go to 105? Yeah, which is 505 for you, right? We're in the five hour time difference now. Good. Jacek, once again, I love your painting, but it's your hand. <laughs> yes, it's my hand. Yeah, I, I just wanted uh, uh, to, to mention this rally around the flag event, uh, in fact, uh, in Poland. I, uh, I don't know which, which opinion Paul Peter is referring to, but at least uh, some, some of the polling indicates that it's very moderate in Poland uh, so far. I mean, I don't know what will happen after Kaczynski's visit, but the most recent poll I saw was basically showed that support for the ruling party uh, is, uh, is uh, more or less the same as before the invasion. And this is a, 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 an opinion poll which usually sort of overrepresents the support for the ruling party. So uh, and my explanation is that since this, is, this, this, this issue of the war and Russia is uniquely bipartisan, that is, there are not big differences between what people, what voters for the ruling party and voters for the opposition feel about this war. There is no obvious, you know, like, uh, there is not obvious sense that, yeah, the government was right and the opposition was wrong, so we will, uh, we will, uh, we will, uh, we will, you know, move our support to, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to the government. I mean, I, 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 I think that uh, on, on other issues like, you know, democracy, rule of law, uh, the society is, is, is as divided as, as before this war started and the, the, uh, the discussion between the government and, and, uh, and the opposition is as heated as before. So it, it really, I, I don't see how this war healed the, the differences, the political differences, even though, as I say, there is a remarkable convergence of opinion on, on these issues, like supporting Ukraine, supporting the refugees, uh, uh, you know, uh, feeling threat from Russia. That, that doesn't divide people politically here, but, uh, but the effects on Polish politics, I think we need to wait and see. I see that Peter sent me some links, so I will, I will look at it and which poll. <laughs> yeah, Peter sent the poll. I can also, maybe Larissa can help me. We can send that poll to the audience members too. There's two more. We got a lot of questions in the chat, but I won't get to them. I'm sorry, everybody, but you know, we'll meet again. But I wanted, there's just two more things I want to do. One is I want, and this is, you know, this is for Veronica as much as it is. Um, the, the Russian misinformation or disinformation campaign, whatever you want to call it. How is that, how's that playing out in Central Europe? Because this is, and I know, Veronica, that's very much part of your uh, wheelhouse, as we say here. And I'll start with Veronica again, but what does this mean for this, this hybrid intrusions you spoke about earlier and that we can apply to Central Europe more generally? So, Veronica, over to you. Yeah, um, well, Russian propaganda <clears throat> currently uh, is working really hard are to create the greatest possible differences of opinion and national unrest um, in European Union, uh, in Eastern European countries, and and to undermine the willingness of the states to help Ukraine and the willingness of the people to help Ukrainian refugees. Um, in the Czech Republic, we already see a large amount of disinformation associated with refugees. Um, these narratives are trying to create an impression that we should not help them for various reasons. Uh, the most common are like these opinions that claim that, or disinformation that they, they claim that Russian refugees have enough of their, you know, things because they're coming with smartphones and money because apparently, um, according to the Czech disinformers, Ukrainian refugees are just like running away I don't know, from a camp or something. Um, so that we shouldn't give them any money, we shouldn't help them because they have enough. Uh, or that um, it's it's often compared to the Czech citizens um, at whose expense, allegedly, the Czech government helps the refugees. So uh, the Russian propaganda is trying to create this 
like hateful environment um, towards uh, the Ukrainian refugees. And very often there are also uh, narratives that claim that there is no war taking place in Ukraine. And this is just a staged action to, to serve as a cover uh, for the smuggling of African and Middle Eastern refugees into Eastern countries, Eastern European countries. Uh, it's uh, these kind of disinformation are related also with the visit of uh, of the officials that happened uh, just yesterday or today. Uh, there are people uh, or disinformation claiming that uh, this is the proof that there is like no war in Ukraine because they wouldn't travel there if there would be a, you know a war happening, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think in general. Um, I'd say that the main goal of Russian propaganda right now is to create such a hateful environment that state, uh, states uh, must deal with their internal problems and not discussing how to help Ukraine. I think that this is right now the main, main purpose for the Russian propaganda. Um, I think we need to, uh, uh, in our countries, in Poland, in Slovakia, in Hungary, in Czech Republic, that we are accepting refugees um, in, in large amounts. It's necessary for us to, um, and, and especially for the governments, to be uh, really transparent and patient uh, with explaining to the citizens what is happening, why is it happening, uh, because people are starting already to be impatient. And um, I think that the strategic communication can help with that. Ronica, and you part, by the way, you partly answered my next question, but thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> okay. extremely illuminating about this, this narrative, okay? Because the, the narrative factory has no end. You know, it doesn't, anything's possible. Jacek. Yes, uh, I, I think that, I mean, uh, we are experiencing this moment that the usual uh, voices of sort of pro-Russian voices have been silenced. Uh, in Poland, uh, but you can already see the two directions into which this Russian propaganda will try to shape Polish public opinion. And one is obviously against the refugees. Uh, so far, it was uh, there were uh, attempts to stir up trouble in, uh, you know, on the border, saying that not only Ukrainians but other refugees uh, uh, are being accepted. So there was a. Uh, an attempt to distinguish between good and bad refugees, but I, I think there will be there will be more attempts to stir up the resentment against against refugees. Even though now the the support for rece receiving them is 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 extremely high, uh, and I think that the the other line of propaganda will be focusing on on. Uh, the fact that supporting Ukraine, Poland uh, puts itself in danger you know, the traditional fears of being betrayed by the West. So, so uh, you, you already hear such voices. They are not very strong because uh, I, I think there is this unique moment when, when people basically uh, are, are, are quite united in their views about what's going on. Uh, but I, I would expect to see more, more of this propaganda as time goes by. Thanks, Jacek. Peter, I see your hand up, but you're next anyway. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I would uh, bring up a, an issue that I think will um, affect all of us. And yeah, you have already touched upon the uh, issue of migration. So far, I would say, I, in this sense, I only know the Hungarian polls, but in Hungary, the public opinion is surprisingly welcoming towards not just ethnic Hungarian, uh, refugees, but Ukrainian refugees as well. And this is a big thing given that A, the government have run a quite strong uh, campaign against Ukraine in the last few years saying, and there is some particles of truth in that, that, that in, in Hungary, some of the, my, uh, in Ukraine, some of the minority rights, especially when it comes to language use, especially in the education was suppressed. So, but and, and also, Ukraine is one of the least popular countries in Hungary, according to many polls. Still, there is no anti-Ukrainian refugee rhetoric. And if we compare that to the anti-refugee uh, hysteria 
uh, at the Middle East crisis. I think it's already a big thing and the government is rather welcoming doesn't do too much to take care of the refugees who are here. It's mostly civic organizations doing that, and there's a very high level of solidarity. But still, at least the fact that they allow the refugees in, I think it's it's already big. And and Hungary have welcomed more than 200,000 refugees already, which is, compared to its size, it's, it's rather remarkable. But I would say that on the middle run and on the long run, I think the, the mood will change. And this kind of disinformation that, that Veronica and Jacek have talked about, this is not uh, that much popped up in Hungary so far. But I think as the time passes and the mood will be more and more, and the, the war becomes a new normal, the mood will be more and more that, okay, we have had enough. We expressed our solidarity, but but we just, we don't have more space for, for refugees. And I think that's, that's where, this uh, bigger wave of disinformation will come from. And where does it come from? Mostly from the uh, troll uh, infrastructure and bot infrastructure in Central Eastern Europe of, of Russia and from the, the, let's say, allies of Russia, the, the useful idiots and the mercenaries on the political spectrum. Why? Because the traditional propaganda channels have, have been shut down. Russia today, Sputnik, are not available in the European Union anymore. They are not available uh, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, and you ca cannot even reach most of the time their websites. So the right now, at least, European Union have realized that it has to take some steps uh, against Russian disinformation. And of course, we think that it's still insufficient, but at least what they've done so far, I think is good. Thanks. And on that, you know, it's interesting because the, all three of you anticipated my next question, which was really to inject the human side, which was to talk about the, the fate of the refugees who end up in, in various various neighboring countries. Um, Peter, just one thing. I, we can talk about it later, but this shutdown of RT and Sputnik to me strikes me as as uh, useless and unnecessary. And I'm, I'm not I'm not a fan of shutting down media organizations uh, in general. That's what they do. So I, I don't get... Why? Usually me neither, but it's not a media organization. It's an information yeah. uh, weapon uh, industry and, and, and an artillery factory. So I don't think we should regard it anyhow as, as, I hear as a part you, but of you know, speech. But, it would I be it as, but I need it as a teaching tool. I have to show, I, I have to explain to students what the narrative is. If a narrative is not available, it becomes, in, you know, and I told you what the Finns were doing is the Finnish, you know, the Swedish ambassador said, we don't care that people read RT because it's a small percentage of Sweden and they don't matter. What we're going to do is we're going to make our news, our main news available in Russian. To me, that strikes me as a, as a more uh, useful uh, attempt to answer, you know, the, the stuff that comes from RT and Sputnik. But I used an RT website to explain to students, like, here's the narrative. Let's look at it. Me too. I, I was one of the most enthusiastic visitors of this yeah. site. So I, um, I wasn't in the enthusiastic and was awesome. but <laughs> Let me say, by I had some students. I have my office hours, so I've been joined by a couple of students. One's, in fact, from Lviv. So I'm going to talk to my students. But I cannot tell you how great this, the conversation was. Not And great is probably not the right word, but how important the conversation it was. And how, how really fortunate I am to be able to connect with you. Veronica, for me, it was a real pleasure to meet you. Give my regards to my other friends at Kremlin Watch European Values. We've had we met because of Peter, by the way. You know, the hey Yatsik, that's how this all started. But I really enjoyed the conversation. I'd if you're if you're interested, I think it probably sadly, I don't think what we're talking about is going away. Uh, so I would like to continue the conversation and I thank the audience for their enthusiastic questions. Uh, well, I'll try if you want to write me, I'll try to connect you with some of our visitors. And in the meantime, uh, I say uh, good evening to my friends in Central Europe, and I say good, uh, goodbye and good afternoon to my friends elsewhere. We stay in touch, everybody. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. We talk Bye. soon. Ciao.